Well, we'll switch from Japan now to the Pacific Northwest. Here's our plate tectonic setting. So Pacific Northwest is on the North American plate, what I like to refer to as the leading edge of the North American plate. The Juan de Fuca plate, oceanic plate, is diving down underneath the North American plate. Subduction zone earthquake, what we're talking about, you know, the Pacific Northwest big one, as we sometimes refer to it, is a subduction zone earthquake occurring on a shallow part here of the Cascadia subduction zone. And you'll see a notice here, a decoration that says 1700 subduction zone earthquake. So the last of these great Cascadia earthquakes occurred January 26, 1700 at about 9 p.m. That's 105 years before Lewis and Clark got out to Fort Clatsop. And it's a fair question, how can you possibly know that? It's a, it's a really interesting scientific detective story, how that got figured out. 30 years ago, geologists, especially seismologists, did not think that the Cascadia subduction zone was capable of producing great earthquakes. They didn't think we ever had great earthquakes. We now know that we do have great earthquakes. Recurrence time is about 500 years. So these earthquakes are analogous to the Sumatra 04, Chile 2010, and this earthquake that just occurred two weeks ago in Japan. Well, ground subsidence is a really important part of the story. So co-seismic subsidence. These are images from northern part of Sumatra before and after the earthquake that occurred uh, December 26, 2004. This area experienced about four to six minutes of very severe ground shaking. Um, the buildings in general are not uh, built very strongly, so many of the buildings collapsed. Furthermore, the tsunami that wiped over the top of this peninsula was about 50 feet high, so it just cleaned the whole place off. In addition to that, what you can see here is the level of the ground dropped with respect to sea level during the earthquake, in this particular case by about a meter and a half. So areas that were above sea level before the earthquake are now below sea level. This also happened during the um, last great Earth Cascadia subduction zone earthquake in 1700. And it's an important key to figuring out that the earthquake happened. So the scientific hero of this story is Brian Atwater, shown here. He's a US Geological Survey uh, scientist. He works in Seattle. Um, and he got intrigued by places like this. This is the ghost forest on the Copalis River, which is um, on the Washington coast west of Olympia. These snags here, these are standing dead stalks of western red cedar. Cedar is very rot resistant. So these trees have been dead for 311 years, yet they're still standing. Brian thought that these ghost forests were trying to tell us something important had, about what had happened in this area. They had some kind of message. And he eventually figured out that these coastal drowned forests, or ghost forests, as they're sometimes referred to, they record the history of slow uplift between earthquakes, followed by very rapid subsidence during great earthquakes. And he began to work that out. Other people have contributed to this story. There are quite a few scientists who have worked on this. Uh, one important contributor is right down at Oregon State University, a guy named Chris Goldfinger, who has looked at sediments offshore, what we call turbidites, and has discovered that they have a record in them as well that corroborates the, the on-land record. Um, so every Batman needs a Robin. So um, Brian's Robin is David Yamaguchi. And he's a dendrochronologist, so he's an expert on tree ring dating. They recognized right away that it would be very important to figure out when these trees in the ghost forest died. And to do this from one ghost forest to the next to the next and figure out whether the dates of the formation of these ghost forests and the subsidence was coincident all the way along the entire margin. It turns out that it is. So after many years of work, they figured it out that by they could compare the tree rings in the trees that were killed, so the trees that are in the ghost forest, to what they call witness trees. So these are trees which are nearby, same species of trees experiencing the same climate and so forth, but on a little bit higher ground. So the witness tree felt the ground shaking from the earthquake, but was not killed by the earthquake. The result then ends up that they could determine that the ghost forest and the ground subsidence and the causal earthquake 
had occurred sometime between the end of the growing season in 1699, so the fall of 1699, and the beginning of the growing season in 1700, so sometime in the springtime of 1700. Once they had it narrowed down to that interval of time, then the Japanese scientists could start looking through the historic records in Japan, and they could actually look for evidence that a tsunami had arrived in Japan from this earthquake. That's the orphan tsunami part of the story. Well, another look here put the ghost force into context. So the pressure builds up here, subducting plate, locked by friction to the overriding plate, squeezes the overriding plate. As it does that, it drags down the leading edge of the plate, but it bows up the coastal area. So the coastal area lifts up as the energy is being stored. So this is where the ghost forest is. It's right here near the coast. When the earthquake occurs, this area drops down. So that's the, the sudden subsidence that happens. At the same time, the very leading edge of the plate jumps outwards here and uplifts because it's on an inclined plane and it's jumping, jumping outwards. So it lifts up, it produces this big mound of ocean water, and you get a tsunami. Another view of the same thing in a block diagram, Cascadia subduction zone boundary here, lifting up, producing a big mound of ocean water. Makes a tsunami that goes both directions. So the tsunami comes onshore quickly, within tens of minutes, and then the mirror image runs out towards the open ocean, heads over to Japan. So making a ghost forest, how does it work? The ghost forest is happy before the earthquake, right? It's got prodigious amounts of rain on the Oregon or Washington coast. Earthquake comes along, boom, ground level drops down by three, four, five feet. It gets flooded by local seawater. Within tens of minutes, tsunami roars on shore, carrying beach sand with it, lays a layer of beach sand on top of the forest soil, kills the trees, salt water is toxic to the trees, and then over the course of the succeeding decades and centuries, intertidal muds and clades slowly, slowly, slowly build up here. Eventually you can get a soil and you can get a salt marsh with the standing dead, dead stocks that were killed um, by submergence into the intertidal zone. So that's how the ghost forests work. This is, a, this is a photograph of what Brian Atwater refers to as the three-layer cake of Cascadia tsunami geology. So you get an organic, rich, dark forest soil here, a layer of beach sand on top of it. So this is the tsunami sand. And then intertidal muds and clays, finer grain stuff going on up for several feet until you get up to the salt marsh. Here's a bigger photograph of that same thing. It's a little bit bigger, but not a lot bigger than life size. So the bars on the handle of this shovel are about 10 centimeters, so four inches. So this is only about you know, 1.5 times real, real life scale here on the screen. And if you look carefully here, I think you can see that inside of this tsunami sand layer, can you pick out these layers within that layer? These are literally individual sand layers from the multiple waves of that tsunami. The tsunami is not one wave. It's a series of waves. There's another thing right here. There's actually a clump of marsh grass. And when you get up close to this, you can see that the marsh grass has kind of been draped over like this. So the tsunami came in from this direction, laid sand on top of it, and sort of draped it over. So it's sort of pointing. It's pointing inland. So this is on the banks of the Neowiacum River, which is right on the east side of Willapa Bay. So this is a geologic record of that 1700 earthquake. Take all that information and put it into an animation. So Juan de Fuca plate, North American plate, boundary gets stuck together, starts squeezing the North American plate, this area near the coast is bulging upwards. It's uplifting. The ghost forest is growing here. Earthquake happens, drops it down. Tsunami comes on shore within tens of minutes. So the trees get killed, and this is kind of beginning the process again. Well, besides coming on shore, right, the other half of the tsunami heads off to the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So the Japanese are indeed the world's experts on tsunamis and on earthquakes. They've been experiencing them for centuries. They figured out a long time ago, centuries ago, 
that if the ground shakes violently in Japan, it is very likely that within tens of minutes, you might get a big wave coming in from the ocean. It's a Japanese word, right? Tsunami is a Japanese word. It means harbor wave. Every once in a while, they would get a tsunami that would arrive on Japanese shorelines that was not preceded by ground shaking. So from their perspective, it was a tsunami that did not have a parent earthquake. So that's where they came up with this term, the orphan tsunami, right? It's, an, it's a tsunami which, from their po point of view, does not have a parent earthquake. Well, it does have a parent earthquake, but the parent earthquake is on the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So this shows the orphan tsunami created by that earthquake in Cascadia being shipped across the Pacific Ocean to Japan. So the earthquake happens, runs across the ocean 500 miles per hour towards Japan. We know how long it's going to take, nine hours, to get from the Cascadia subduction zone over to Japan. Well, at that time, Japanese had calendars. Japanese had clocks. They recorded when this orphan tsunami arrived. All you have to do is subtract nine hours, and you get the result that the last great Cascadia subduction zone earthquake occurred January 26, 1700, at about 9 PM. It was observed by Native American groups all the way from Northern California clear up into Western British Columbia. There are Native American oral histories about the great wave that arrived in the night and put the canoes in the trees. Well, we should have listened, right? We should have listened to that. We didn't. So we had to work this out. And in hindsight, you know, we can see the wisdom of the Native American groups that had that in their oral histories. 